like the fear ha may have a tendency of not going away, you know, or, or the anxiety may not go away. What's the long-term effect of this? Well, a lot of people who have this problem where they have a lot of anxiety for chronic periods of time could easily tell you that often there's a breakdown in the system. <laughs> Um, the, the fight or flight response was designed to be an emergency response, a short-lived response, and then there's a time afterwards for recovery. But if you're sitting in traffic jams for two hours every single day, day after day after day, and then you're worried about what's going to be happening at work all day long, and then you come home and you have to deal with the bills, and it's just on and on and on like that, uh, there tends to be a breakdown. And people experience all kinds of symptoms. Um, uh, such as uh, uh, chronic headaches, stomach problems, muscle aches and pains, and also difficulties in changing uh, certain aspects of their um, activities of daily living. So they may e eat too much or not eat enough, or sleep too much or not sleep enough, uh, irritability, poor concentration. These are the kinds of things that begin to tell us that the anxiety is uh, taking its toll and we really have to do something about it. And then that can bleed into all aspects of their life, either uh, on their own body and their own health, on their ability ability to be able to perform at their best, to be able to be as productive as they could be, or the quality of their relationships, Absolutely. I would figure. So what is it about different people that cause them to respond in different ways? Because you could have two people that are subjected to the same kinds of stresses, and yet one person would be fearful and anxious, and the other person, it rolls off their back like water off a duck. All right, well, I'll give you a little psychology 101 here, and, and you know, I, um, I'm executive director at the Stress and Anxiety Services of New Jersey, and there we practice cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a very specific kind of therapy. And a lot of the focus there is on cognitions, which is just a fancy word for thoughts, thinking. And the idea there basically is the way we think about something has profound implications for how we respond physiologically and emotionally. Um, and so it's really... Um, the thinking process, the way that we think about something as opposed to the thing itself that will make us anxious. That's why you can have two people in the very same circumstance and one reacts calmly and the other reacts more negatively um, um, or overreacts. Uh, one person says, I can handle this, this will be okay, or there's really nothing I can do about this right now, I need to just kind of move on. And the other person will just sort of bang his or her head against the wall saying, this can't be happening, I can't let this happen, I have to do something, um, even when there really isn't very much that they can do about it. What determines how a person reacts the way that they do, Alan? Is it something, is it genetic? Is, is a person's reaction to circumstances something that's pre-programmed in, or is it something that they learned growing up? Uh, the $10 million question. Uh, the short answer to that is, well, we really don't know. Um, but it's clear that both of those uh, components play a role, that whole nature and nurture controversy. The problem is if I grew up in a household where my parents are both you know, very calm and tend to be very thoughtful and react slowly to things in terms of their emotional reactivity, well, uh, if I'm the same way, how do I know if that's because they modeled it for me and I learned that way or because somehow they genetically transferred to me that way of being? Um, the sense is that there tends to be a genetic predisposition and then your uh, experience growing up has strong influence on how you learn to deal with things. Well, that covers all the bases, doesn't it? I told you we really don't know. <laughs> so, Alan, I speak, you know, being the father of a couple of kids and uh, knowing a lot of other parents in town, and you have a family too, uh, you know, parents today are very concerned with the type of childhood experience that our children have. It seems to be very different than the experiences that we had as kids, where we came home from school and then we had plenty of time to go outside and play and air out a little bit, right. and then have dinner with our family and then go upstairs, do our homework, and then go to bed at a decent hour. But a lot of the parents that I speak with today, and I can see from our own children at home too, they don't have that kind of experience like we had as kids. Uh, these are intelligent children that come home, don't have time to be able to go outside and play, have to hit the books from the time that they get home and work sometimes straight through to the, you know, the middle of the night, getting to bed at around 11 or 12 o'clock and under tremendous stress. What can we do about something like that? We can't change the curriculum in the school. That's right. So what do parents, what options do parents have to be able to help their kids when they're subjected to these kinds of stresses. Well, this is a really good example, Ken, of how you can look at a situation and basically say, all right, what can I control and what can't I control? 
at, at the very core of stress management is being able to ans answer that question. Because if you answer that question incorrectly, then you're trying to change things in your life that are really not changeable, and you are banging your head against the wall. On the other hand, if you accept things that you can influence without trying to change them, well, then you're subjecting yourself to stressors, stress situations that you really don't have to. So in this particular example, um, there is school curriculum. There are um, a lot of competitive sports and, and organizations that kids belong to these days. And if you try to pull them out of everything, the problem is that because all the other kids are involved in those things, it isn't like they have a whole bunch of kids down the block to play with like maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, so you really can't do that. And I don't think you're, you know, the children that you have, or that anybody would have, would necessarily appreciate that. Uh, I think more than anything else, it's about saying, well, wh how can we influence this in some way? And that's about striking some kind of a balance, making sure that um, there is time for a family to be together, to try to work out as best as possible to have at least one night or two nights a week where everybody eats together dinner, um, uh, to, to set certain limits on how much time kids are on Facebook or how many activities they do engage in. Um, and to negotiate that and make the child uh, part and parcel of that negotiation process so they feel like they have an influence on the process, but that they have to recognize that there are limits. They can't do everything, even if any one of those things would be a good thing to do. You can't do everything. So it sounds to me what we're really talking about is things that parents may be able to do to expand their children's capacity. Uh, in other words, what you're suggesting is, is that not to put time or energy or focus or attention on the things that you can't do anything about and focus your time and energy and efforts on the things that you can do something about. So as an expert and as an expert that also specializes in helping lots of families and children, what would you say would be, if there is such a thing, a balance between academics, social and personal? Well, I'm not going to come up with any particular formula because that's going to be a very individualized thing depending on the kid, depending on the family, uh, depending on their social situation. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that it, it, it is something that needs to be negotiated where both the parents and the child are part and a part of the process so that the child feels that he or she has a say in terms of what it is that they're allowed to do or what it is that they're saying no to and it really isn't just dictated by the parents. So what would be some of the signs that a parent would observe that would tip them off as to whether or not things are out of balance? Okay. Um, well, um, uh, we have a term that are called stress response patterns. The things that a person does behaviorally, emotionally, the, but that they experience that indicates there's a problem, that there's stress in a bad way. And so things like if you see that your child is grades are falling, if you find that uh, they tend to be irritable, they're having difficulty falling asleep, they're not eating where they normally would eat, um, those are the kinds of uh, signs that something is wrong. You know, for so many problems that, that parents experience with their kids, you hear one line that comes over and over and over, comes up over and over again, and that is spend time with your kids, talk to them, but most importantly, listen to them. Because if you have open communication with your child, if they feel comfortable enough that you have the time and the energy to spend being there for them and listening to them, they will get into the habit of talking to you when they're feeling stressed, when they're having problems, and then they can use you uh, as the resource that you should be for them and as the support that you should, that you should be there for them. So it seems like one of the age-old challenges that the older generation seems to have with the younger generation is the ability to be able to effectively communicate. Yes. What is it that parents can do to be able to open up the lines and foster open communication between uh, their children and themselves? Uh, one is to start doing it from an early age, from a very early age. Um, the other is to make it something of a habit. And so, you know, the standard used to be you sit around the dinner table and how was your day kind of thing. Uh, we can't always do that, but there's times in the car. And the car rides are wonderful opportunities to engage with your kid rather than having the, the radio blasting or having them tune into the iPod or their, um, uh, you know, whatever electronic device they're playing with. Uh, so, uh, so having, making the time, and that when you're involved in a conversation with your child, to um, make rules about electronic interference. And what I mean by that is, I don't want to have a conversation with you while you're having a conversation texting someone else, which they do amongst themselves all the time, and I'm not necessarily saying that itself is a problem, but you really want to be present, and you want to teach them to be present uh, with you when um, you're having a talk with them about things that you're concerned about, or just asking them how their, how their day is. Alan, earlier you alluded to the importance of 
a person's mindset you know that uh, you work with people on how they think and that seems to be a, a very timeless value you know as even in the Bible it it's it states that as a man thinketh so shall it be done mm -hmm. unto him uh, and many people who have been experts in success and in motivation talk about the importance of positive thinking um, what are some of the things that can actually